Malcolm here and welcome. Welcome to Tuesday Teaching Tips episode 92 and today we're talking about how to start strong. How to start strong and this comes from a question I was asked on Quora that I answered to and I've expanded it and adjusted it a little bit for this episode here on Teaching Tips. So how do we start strong? Well, when we're beginning a sermon, a teaching opportunity, how do we start strong? Now, some of the tips I have for us here don't apply in all circumstances. It might be a bit different if you're in a very informal environment compared to what I'm going to talk about today. But when it's a more formal situation of delivering a talk, delivering a sermon, delivering a, t a lesson of some kind, I think these tips will work. And I think they're scriptural. We see them in the Bible. And we're going to look in particular at the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts to deal with this. So we see that really most of the time we get up to speak, an audience is willing to give us their attention, and that's why they're there, but it would be unwise to take them or their attention for granted. And so how we start demonstrates that we have something significant to say, but it also demonstrates that we take the attention and the time of the people we're speaking to seriously. If we have something important to say, we might as well say something important to begin with, rather than have several minutes of waffle before we talk about anything important. And by that stage, your audience may have given up hope that anything interesting is coming along. So how we begin is very important. So let's first of all talk about some do nots. And again, all the things I'm talking about today they're not rules as such. They're more guidelines and things garnered from experience and what we see uh, in the Bible, but more of that in a minute. So some do nots. First do not. Don't start your talk by telling them all about yourself. They probably already know who you are. And if they don't, somebody should have told them. It shouldn't be your responsibility to tell them who you are. And even if you do feel that responsibility, it's usually not very helpful. I'm so-and-so, I live in so-and-so, I've come from so-and-so, I have these qualifications. That's not the thing that's most important to your audience. That's about you. We, we need to start with something that helps them to understand that something important is being dealt with in our talk that day. So don't start with yourself. The audience is your point, is the point, not you. Secondly, don't say bland things like, oh, it's nice weather today. Oh, it's good to see you. Oh, hello. Nice to be here. These are bland. They mean nothing. You're wasting the precious time that you have. And worst of all, they begin to bore the people who are listening to you. They've heard a thousand people say that. Why don't you say something different? That's our second thing. And the third thing is to talk about irrelevant things like the price of fish or the fact that you feel a bit hot or something that really is nothing to do with your audience, is nothing to do with their needs, and is nothing to do with your topic. Why begin with those things? They don't have any relevance. So let's talk about something relevant. Let's keep the focus on the topic at hand. So here are some suggestions for good openers, and I'm going to categorize these into three areas. There are plenty more than this, and I'd like to know your thoughts on, on some that you may know. But here are three that I've tried and seen done well by other people as well. So number one, a short anecdote. A short anecdote that connects the theme with the needs of your audience. So it has to have a connection with your theme and it must also connect with your audience in some way. But a short anecdote, not I think a long story, uh, that takes too long and, and focuses on the story more than perhaps even on the topic. But an anecdote could be useful. I might, if I was giving a talk about the dangers of spiritual procrastination, I might start with, I stayed up all night typing on a small portable typewriter. I begin my anecdote like that. I tell the story about how I almost failed my degree because of procrastination over my dissertation. But I'm starting with an anecdote. It's, it's a mini story, but it's more of an anecdote than a story, depending on how I tell it. But I begin with that, and then I lead them into what happened, and then I talk about my procrastination and how it almost made me fail my degree, and I can talk about spiritual procrastination from there and the dangers of it. So you could start with a short anecdote like that. In Acts chapter 17, in a way, Paul does this. He stands up in chapter 17, verse 22, and says, People of Athens, I see in every way that you are very religious, for as I walked around and looked carefully at the objects of worship, I even found 
an altar with this inscription to an unknown god. It's sort of an anecdote. He's talking to them about how he was walking around earlier. It's a bit like the old musical cliche of, a funny thing happened to me on the way to the theatre tonight. And then the comedian tells a story which didn't really happen. Uh, but uh, that's what Paul is doing. He said, I was wandering around and I saw this. It's kind of an anecdote and he draws them into what he's saying. So that's an idea. Tell a short anecdote that connects with the point, point of your lesson and the needs of your audience. Secondly, a second way to begin to have a strong start is to ask a question. It might be rhetorical, it might be one for which you hope to get a response, and the kind of question you ask will depend upon the level of interaction you want to have with your audience or the level of interaction that's possible given the setting you're in, a large group of a stadium of several thousand might be a bit different from a group of a hundred or so. And it may also depend on what kind of participation you expect or hope from uh, the people you're speaking to. But something like a question can, a, a question of some kind can be very, very helpful. My last sermon two days ago, my most recent one, began with a question. I asked the question, do you like having a clear conscience? And I wasn't looking there for specific answers. It was more of a rhetorical question, but I knew I'd get a response, and I did. If you look at the video, you may hear that in the background. It's on my YouTube channel. Do you, do you like having a clear conscience? And there was an audible, oh, yeah. Well, then how do we have a clear conscience? Then we go into the topic of having a clear conscience, which was my topic. Simple question, um, kind of rhetorical, but it certainly helped people to connect, because they do want and value a clear conscience. We talked about how that felt. So do you like having a clear conscience was more of a rhetorical question, but I also asked a question a bit further into the uh, sermon, but you could ask this at the beginning, which was what are the signs that you know when you have a guilty conscience? What signs are there? What symptoms? And I asked people to share there. And so I was looking for interaction. So that's more of a direct question, looking for interaction. Those are trickier at the very beginning to do well, but uh, they can work as well. In Luke chapter 13, verse 2, Jesus asks a question, do you think these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? He's asking a question of what appears to be the beginning of a talk there as he goes on to talk about repentance. So there you've got an example there. In Acts chapter 3, verse 12, after a healing, Peter asks the crowd, why does this surprise you? And it's a bit of a rhetorical question, but it leads him into uh, the rest of his talk. So a second thing you could do to start strong is to ask a question. Firstly, a short anecdote. Secondly, asking a question. The third thing you can do is to make a statement that gets attention. So this is something that they wouldn't have expected to hear. A statement that gets attention. So not too controversial because otherwise the, the audience tends you lose them because they're now thinking about does he really mean that does she really mean that that's ridiculous that's not even that's bad that's terrible that's well that's really weird but and what's what's wrong with him or her that's speaking so uh, not too controversial you'll lose people but thought provoking and again connected in some way to the need of your hearers even if they can't see what the connection is straight away but you'll go into that so a statement that gets attention for example i heard this recently there are more active phone connections in the world today than there are people can you get your head around that that's over 7.7 .7 billion phone connections there are more phone connections in the world today than there are people alive. And you might go on then to talk about connectivity, but, but are we really connected? Uh, those phone connections are there, but are we connected? The loneliness is an epidemic. You could go into that. But that, that statement of, gosh, that's, is that true? And it is true. There are more phone connections today than there are people alive. That's astonishing. Or this kind of statement. Kim Kardashian has been significantly influential in helping Americans understand risk. And I, I think that's unusual enough to get people's attention. Kim Kardashian, whatever you may think of her, that she has been significantly influential in helping Americans understand risk. Well, it's true because she tweeted about the fact that there are 69, 69 people in America are killed by lawnmowers every year. And again, you may say, what's the relevance of that? Well, we come to that. But doesn't it get your attention? Six, she retweeted this statistic, 69. 
69 Americans are killed by lawnmowers every year, and that's tragic. But the point of that statistic was to compare it with others. Compared to 21 are killed by toddlers with firearms, and 11,737 Americans are killed by another adult American, compared to the fact that only two Americans were killed by Islamic jihadi immigrants. Those are some interesting statistics. And then you might go on to talk about, from that point you could go on to talk about the significance of understanding the, the right priorities or, or getting the right point or not getting the wrong end of the stick or not being too shocked by something without looking into the detail of it. You could then talk about the Bereans or examine the scriptures carefully to see if what Paul said was true. They wanted to really know if it was true rather than just listen. To, I mean, there are various ways you could take that. But there's an interesting, if you like, shocking statistic. In Luke chapter 14, verse 26, Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you've got to hate your father and mother. That sounds wrong. It sounds bizarre. But it got people's attention. And then you can teach. He taught, of course, what that meant about being a disciple and following him. And his loyalty to him is more significant than to any other human being. But he did say that. And it certainly got people's attention. It still gets people's attention today. Or in Acts 23, if we go there, in Acts 23, we'll look at the example of Paul uh, again in this situation. In Acts 23 and in verse 6, yes, chapter 23, verse 6, Paul, knowing that some were Sadducees, some Pharisees, called out to the San Sanhedrin, my brothers, I am a Pharisee, descended from Pharisees. I stand on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. And he knew that would start an argument or a debate between the Sadducees and the Pharisees because they had different views on that. And so the focus was then taken off him. But he made a statement that he knew would be controversial to some people because it was going to help him get to where he needed to, which was ultimately to get to Rome, as we see in Acts 28. So that was good. So we have lots of examples and we could go through more. But I'd like to th for us to be thinking about the next time you start a talk, how might you begin it in a way that has strength? Not a bullying kind of strength, not a, an overpowering kind of a strength, but just something that signifies to the people listening that you are about to talk about something that really matters and is going to be interesting and helpful. How will you do that? Rehearse your first line, Re rehearse your first sentence or even your first paragraph and perhaps use one of these three suggestions, either a short anecdote uh, use a question, rhetorical, or one if you, or a different one if you want a response, or a statement that gets attention. I have a few more thoughts on this in one of my earlier teaching tips uh, in the days when I wasn't giving them numbers, so I don't have a number for it, but it's called When Does a Speech Begin? And that has some connections with what I talked about today. So if you want to look that up, I recorded that on the 14th of October 2016. It's on my YouTube channel. You'll find it there and you should find it on my website also, malcolmcox.org. But that's called When Does a Speech Begin? Uh, uh, connected to some of the things we're talking about here today. So I hope you enjoy your next opportunity to preach or teach. It's always a privilege to bring God's word to people who are willing to listen. And since they're willing to listen, they deserve us to give them our best opening line, starting strong, as hopefully we mean to go on. So what do you think about this? Have you seen other people start in a way that really captures people's attention and helps? Have you seen it done badly? And, uh, and if you could share this, leave a comment wherever you hear or see this recording. That would be so helpful because I would like to know, and I know all the other people, and a lot of people watching this into these, would also benefit because we learn from one another. And that's the best way to learn. We learn best when we learn in community. So please leave a comment. And finally, one favor, please pass this link on to one other person. One other person who might benefit in their own speaking and their own teaching and preaching so that the, as many people as possible can start their talks strong. Well, I hope you have a terrific Tuesday and a wonderful week. God bless.